Thank you so much, folks, for joining us for the community session. Um, I'm so happy to see you all trickling in now. Um, so what do we have in uh, store today for you? Well, of course, it's the end of the year. So we are going to look back. Um, I can already share that it was an amazing year. Um, we have uh, Imanchu who will uh, talk more about that and share more about that. Um, we have some awesome new content for you to deliver uh, inside your companies or anywhere where you want to talk about uh, backstage on birthdays or uh, maybe uh, some meetup or something like that. Um, and we have this really, really cool new explainer video. We have Jen in the house, who's uh, uh, the head of marketing, and she will share everything uh, about, uh, about that. Um, and yes, we have an uh, exciting presentation. Uh, this time from uh, Brex. So James is here. Um, I do not see James yet, or do I? Ah, so many names. Um, but I, I get. I guess James is here uh, to do that. Um, and we have a little discussion around what can you do to like make a brand of your backstage uh, implementation. Should you or should you should you not do that? So uh, Jen will share. Uh, a lot of uh, thoughts on that um, as well um, as the things our, uh, uh, we see our adopters uh, do. So that is really exciting, uh, I think, for today. So um, yeah, let's get started. So Himanshu, you're here, luckily. Hi. Hey. All I right. think it's been an amazing year, right? So, And, and everyone will see why, uh, thanks to our Creativity. So if you're around um, the Baxis community last year, you might have seen some glimpses, but I'm going to present two videos and bear, bear with me. There are 30 seconds and 58 seconds. So they're not long uh, and they have music. Oof, <laughs> getting exciting. Um, so yeah, look out for 80 names that you can recognize in the next minute. Um, yeah, some of you might have recognized that was Gors or Gors.io. It's an open source software where you can um, just add your Git history and it just connects things. So that was just a bit of fireworks that happened in the backstage code base in the last year with, I don't know, 500 people and more. Um, so that was that. You got a preview. We're going to upload it on YouTube and you can share um, later on. But uh, the next one is a world map, and we can visualize all these contributions coming in from different parts of the world. Let's do that. All right, uh, so yeah. And as you saw, 950 people created pull requests and issues on backstage and and yeah, uh, watch out for more end of the year content, would you, Suzanne? 
Yeah, because, uh, well, that's already a, a bit of a scoop, I think. Um, but we will doing this whole post where we will um, share all the statistics we can find and are excited to share. Um, but yeah, first of all, thank you, everybody. Like, it is really amazing because each of these flashing uh, um, spectacular uh, lines on the screen is actually a contribution or any other way uh, somebody contributes to the project. Right, so um, it is not only about adding code to the project, but also uh, doing doing all the stuff uh, stuff around it. Um, we see more and more people doing talks at conferences, and that is really cool. So thank you uh, again uh, for for doing all that, and watch out for the uh, for the end of year uh, post, which will be there next week, I think. Yeah. So um, talking about things to share. Jen is in the house. Um, Jen, are you here? Because Hi, everybody. you have something to share about something to share. Yeah, absolutely. So I will definitely um, uh, preview the, 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 the end of year numbers we were talking about um, because I think they're just so exciting and, I, that, and this community deserves to hear it first. But, you know, we are ending the year with over 75 uh, public adopters. We are um, ending the year with 500 plus contributors. We are uh, almost 2,000 forks, 9,000 contributions and over 4,000 members on Discord, which are just some of those like high level stats that Suzanne was mentioning. And again, that'll be on a, in a blog post uh, wrapped up for uh, wrapping the year up in uh, on .io next week. However, in the meantime, we're really excited to share some assets that we've built that we are going to be, we're, we, we're intended to, I think, solve a problem we were hearing from a lot of folks, which is sort of how do I introduce backstage inside of my organization? How do I evangelize it? How do I tell, how do I tell sort of the top level story about what it is? So we have um, not only uh, an explainer video, which you saw some of the some of the graphic stylings around um, in and as we were getting ready to start. Um, and Tim already shared the link, but I'm going to share it again um, in terms of where you can go to find this video. Um, I'm also going to share uh, the the YouTube link. Um, and uh, it's but it it's intended to to do just that in under two minutes. And uh, and so we're proud not only of the quick runtime, but the incredible um, production work. And, and thank you again to everyone who worked on that. And then we've also got a pitch deck to for you to uh, both long and short versions um, that we are able, we're, I'm also gonna link in chat in terms of where you can go to uh, steal this deck. Um, so the long and short, the, the short version is really the backstage basics. Um, what's a developer portal? What's backstage key use cases and benefits, key architectural concepts. Um, and then the longer version includes um, more mark, market context, more on sort of the open source community and a higher level look at all of the, this great work that everyone's doing, core concepts and philosophies in the software model of backstage, a lot about uh, the YAML and extensibility via plugins and some deployment and adoption strategies. So hopefully these are useful for you all and please, please, please feel free to, to take them and, uh, and, and bring them inside of your own orgs. Yeah, that's not stop at that. Let us know how you are using this. If you're happy, if you're not happy, um, if you do the narrative uh, differently, just let us know. Um, and feel, feel free to build your own stuff around this because um, this is for you to to you know create your own stuff off of. Absolutely, yeah, feedback is a gift. <laughs> exactly, exactly, um, and you know it's all about iteration. So, <laughs> so that is um, um, let's let's hope to make this uh, this better and better uh, over time together. Um, so thank you for that, Jen. Um, we have James from Brex. Um, so uh, James worked on Brex Cache before uh, its launch. Um, and he is now in a new team um, forming uh, to, to build the, the uh, unification of the infrastructure platform. So I hope I'm, I'm summarizing that, uh, that right, uh, James. Uh, yeah, that is correct. Um, I guess a little bit more background about me is that this team started at the beginning of 2021. So we've only been around for about a year now. And this entire time we've been adopting backstage internally. So 
that's what I hope to present on. Let me uh, share my screen. Cool. Um, so yeah, that, we already know a little bit about me, so I'm just going to kind of hop in here. For anyone, I guess, not familiar with Brex, we are a, a financial technology company um, focusing on trying to create an all-in-one finance platform for businesses, think credit cards, cash management account, um, and software on top of that, like expense management. Um, overall agenda for today is going to start with a little bit of background on kind of um, why we decided to create a developer portal, then talk about our adoption path, um, how we are or how we got to where we are today with backstage learnings from this adoption path. And if there's any questions, um, hope to answer those uh, at the end as well. So if anyone's not familiar with Backstage, we, I mean, with Brex, we were founded back in 2017. So we're still a fairly young company, not even five years old yet, but we've seen really rapid growth um, year over year for the last few years. I guess the every year since Brex has been founded, we've more than doubled our headcount um, and more than doubled our engineering headcount. We're sitting at around a thousand employees right now in total with about half of that falling into engineering product and design. And with this ever growing number of, or this rapidly growing number of engineers, we've seen a large increase in the number of workloads, which we consider any deployable unit of software, um, as well as a growing number of tools. Um, although we have tried to uh, be deliberate with our tool choices and keep them from growing unbounded. They still grow over time. Um, and this problem um, started to show its head a lot last year when we were going from less than 100 developers to a few hundred um, at the start of this year. So as I meant, or as Suzanne mentioned earlier, we decided to create this team internally. Um, to focus on this problem, and our mission is to provide a centralized platform that simplifies and caters to the daily workflows of de developers at Brex. And this was our mission even before we knew what Backstage was. Um, so we started looking for ways to solve this problem. Here is a number of tools that we use internally, and this is only a fraction of the ones that I uh, put on this slide. But as you can see, there's at least a dozen here and probably a few other dozen that we use internally as well. So we realized it was becoming increasingly hard for engineers to keep all of this information in their head. As we onboarded new engineers, um, they were constantly asking questions around how do we do X at Brex? Like what tools do we use? How do we use that tool? Um, and we realized this was um, going to become a larger and larger issue, especially as we onboarded more and more engineers every month. Um, so we wanted to try and simplify this problem for engineers so that they could um, not have to worry about knowing every single tool that we use internally um, and just focusing on development. So in, oops, skip the slide. Um, in order to try and solve that, we came up with this idea of a unified interface. Um, which kind of led us to the idea of a developer portal. Basically, we wanted to build a platform of platforms. So um, all of our different platform and infrastructure teams could build their software um, and then put it into a unified interface so that our product developers only had one place to go for the most part. Um, and if there was any additional information, it could kind of be found and led to um, through this unified interface. The main things we wanted to try and solve with this was um, allowing engineers to get a sense of different boundaries and information around their software. So this kind of was where the idea of the software catalog came from. Engineers wanted to know metadata and ownership information around um, different software. So that was um, problem number one we wanted to solve. We also wanted to uh, make sure that all of new software at Brex was going to be created with best practices um, in mind. So similar to the golden pathways, ideas that um, Spotify uses internally. We wanted to make sure that that was easy to do and easy to follow. Um, before we used Backstage, we had a number of different CLIs and tools to kind of do this that we iterated on over time, but they were always harder to maintain and written in um, specific languages you need to know in order to update the templates. 
Um, and then the last thing is we wanted to make sure that whatever this platform was, it was extensible and easy to build into so that all of our different platform teams could easily add their tooling into it. So all of this um, and this idea of this unified interface kind of led us to develop a portal, start researching them, um, what was currently in the market, see if there's anything we could take and build internally um, from open source. And that kind of led us to Backstage, um, which was uh, still in alpha last year when we started looking into it. But we quickly saw that it had this core concept of a service catalog, which was something that we definitely wanted. It had a scaffolder for creating things, and it was very, very extensible, um, which made it a really good candidate for this. So that's kind of how we got to um, Backstage and why we thought it was a, a possible choice. We ended up um, then going through a proof of concept period where we implemented a service catalog using Backstage and our current services. This went really, really quickly and um, made it seem like it was a, a very good choice off the bat. That plus the extensibility really led us to make a quick decision to a, adopt Backstage um, at the beginning of this year, late last year, um, and move forward with it. From there, we kind of adopted different core plugins or um, core or open source plugins from the Backstage community, starting with the the catalog. So, as I said, we adopted. Um, or we used it for cataloging our services, but that was initially the only thing we cataloged. We wanted to then catalog more information um, so that we could build on top of it. So um, we were researching how to do this, how to group software and saw that there was the system entity model already created within Backstage that the um, internal team that Spotify use and realized that this was exactly what we wanted. And we're um, really excited that it already existed and seemed to fit all of our needs. Uh, so we started to catalog um, our asynchronous event consumers and cron jobs into Backstage and grouping them into systems um, with their services so that um, engineers and teams could see all of their related software and how they interact with each other. One thing that we've kind of decided to adopt with um, putting more information in the catalog is not trying to catalog everything at once, but trying to catalog things based on other projects or problems that we're trying to solve. So instead of spending a lot of time upfront getting everything into Backstage, we kind of see what types of projects we're going to be working on and if there's anything we're missing or if we're partnering with teams getting their um, software cataloged into Backstage. So that was the first kind of core plugin or functionality that we adopted. Next thing um, is that we want to get engineers from zero to one quickly and in the right way. So we started investing in the scaffolder and <clears throat> creating templates for our golden or pet paved path of development at Brex, which um, at this time is Kotlin. So we created uh, templates in our scaffolder for all of our different ways to create Kotlin software at Brex, services, consumers, cron jobs, once again. Um, over time, we've added more templates um, into the, the scaffolder, but the main focus was this kind of core um, product development workflow, um, and then slowly adding in templates after that. Um, following that, we wanted to help engineers kind of understand interfaces and service boundaries. So we saw the open source API docs plugin and decided to adopt that as well. Internally, we use gRPC and protobuf um, for inter-service communication. There was a, um, you could use a protobuf in the existing API docs and it would show you the, the protobuf file essentially in the API docs plugin, but there's also an open source protoc um, plugin that will generate protobuf documentation for you based on your protobuf files which we found a little bit more readable. So we generate those protobuf files um, during our build process and then store them in S3. And then we actually use that um, file to show the interfaces between services in Backstage and then relate it back to our software in the software catalog. As you can see here on the um, system entity model, uh, our components provide different APIs and some of them consume other 
And that's how we um, show them in the UI and allow you to um, discover new API docs. Then lastly, the other core plugin that we've been adopting very recently is the uh, Kubernetes plugin. We wanted engineers to be able to easily troubleshoot their software, although there was a there is a number of methods that engineers have used historically at Brex to do this, whether it be um, kubectl directly or tools, open source tools like um, Kubernetes, um, stuff like that to view and discover the cluster. We wanted new engineers to quickly and easily be able to see how their software was functioning um, at Brex um, in the unified interface. Uh, and that's kind of um, the flow of how we have adopted core plugins. But after adopting core plugins, we wanted to make sure that also um, creating internal plugins was fairly easy for our different platform teams. These are plugins that we wouldn't generally open source because they're related to very specific internal um, software and tools that we use. And something, as I've already mentioned, is we use gRPC and protobufs uh, to do inter-service communication at Brex but those aren't necessarily web-friendly um, communication protocols. Generally, you want some sort of JSON HTTP API um, to interact with. So in order to allow our different engineering and platform teams to easily create backend plugins, we decided to implement a gRPC gateway, which is an open source project. Um, I believe Google um, owns this project, but basically it allows you to create a um, reverse proxy and canonical JSON HTTP API from protobuf files and have it interact with your, your protobuf services um, over gRPC. So we can easily create HTTP um, and JSON APIs for all of our different internal backend services um, so that engineers don't have to create backend plugins just to translate protobuf and gRPC into um, HTTP and JSON APIs. Um, so this is something that we did to kind of unlock quick and easy development for internal plugins. Since then, um, some internal plugins that we've created are one to um, manage your, your deploy and release information. So we've been adopting GitOps as our um, deployment um, system over the last six or eight months or so. And we wanted engineers to be able to easily view all of their previous um, GitOps releases as well as manage them, such as rolling back to a previous release in case of an incident, or um, if you want to set your deployment to manually deploy instead of automatically deploy all of your releases into production. Um, another internal plugin we were able to use or implement was um, interactions with our workflow engine. Um, so similar to Box, I think we spoke at the last one, who in integrates with a workflow engine to provision different resources. Um, we have been um, using a workflow engine or trialing one over the past few months as well. Um, we similarly use it for provisioning different uh, resources during scaffolding right now. So to create our Docker um, container registry um, for our, our deployments, we make a call to our workflow engine during scaffolding to automatically create that for us so engineers don't have to create a Terraform PR or have a another PR that they have to go and um, manage and look at. It kind of all happens in the background and make sure that everything um, is secure. Uh, another internal plugin that um, we've created with this internal um, gRPC gateway is a notification timeline where you can view information like when your deploys were rolled out into our Kubernetes cluster, um, monitors slash alerts from Datadog being triggered or going back into a recovered state, pager duty instance all in a single timeline. So you can kind of get a whole sense of um, the life cycle of your deployment, which um, can be useful for incidents to see what was the most recent deploy before a pager duty incident was created for your service. And then lastly, um, another one that we we're able to create with the, the gRPC gateway was a dead letter event um, queue management plugin. So we have a asynchronous event processing infrastructure internally built on Kafka. Originally, um, we had this dead letter functionality in a admin, a, um, admin UI that we used internally. 
but there is a lot of manual information you needed to input. And we were able to automate a, a lot of this by using um, our cataloged consumer information so that engineers can only, only need to view their um, consumers' events off the bat and can easily manage just their consumers' events from the uh, consumer entity page and backstage, as opposed to having to input a bunch of Kafka specific information that um, became less and less relevant to day-to-day -to -day product developers. Um, here is a view of kind of our internal release and deploy um, management plugin. So on our different entity pages, we have a deploys tab where you can on the left view um, your current deploy, um, the Git related information to it. It links out to a bunch of other tools as well that we use our CI CD pipeline, Datadog for logs, um, our Flux state repository. If you scroll down beneath that, you'll see all of the previous candidates and can easily um, roll back on to a specific one. You can switch to manual deploys, as I said. And then we also moved our event timeline to the, the same page here, although it was a separate plugin and backend originally. Um, we decided it made more sense to include this information here on the deploys tab right next to it so you can see all the other related in, uh, events um, with it as well. So uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is kind of how we've been thinking about evangelization and education internally, which has been a big part. Um, so we, we started with about, I think, a 0% adoption rate of Backstage, obviously, at the beginning of this year. We're now hovering a little bit over 30%, so it's still not where we, we'd like it to be. We'd like to get that number up above 50% of weekly active users. Now it's around 30 Um and going from zero to where we are, a big part of that was evangelization and education. Um, we realized off the bat that engineers weren't just going to use a tool because we built it and we wanted them to use it. Even if it was a better developer experience, we had to do a lot of stuff um, to try and make that aware to all of our, the engineering org and spread knowledge around it. So we started with um, an engineering wide presentation where we kind of evangelized backstage by saying what it was about. Uh, you could develop on it, um, what we had been building in it. This was probably six or so months ago um, when we still didn't have a lot of functionality in Backstage. So we once again quickly realized that until we were solving a lot of core problems and showing them how to use Backstage to solve those core problems, um, it wasn't necessarily going to be a, a game changer. But um, later this year, um, as we got more functionality in there, we did another company our engineering wide presentation at an internal um, developer conference and showed engineers in a step-by-step -step process how you could debug your service using um, backstage how you could roll back to a previous deploy using it um, to remediate incidents and saw a lot more interactions with it um, after we were able to show them step-by-step -step exactly how you could use it to solve some of your problems um, some other ways we've been evangelizing is we started doing a, a new hire training recently. So now every single engineer um, goes through a um, 101 session with a member of our team where we walk through um, all the different tooling in Backstage and our ex our, some of the other tooling at Brex as well um, and how you can use it in your day to day. Um, but that only kind of captures all of the new hire um, cohorts. It doesn't capture existing teams um, at Brex. So We've also been doing team specific training where we'll, where we'll work with managers to set up um, trainings for a specific org or team within engineering and give a similar presentation to our new hire training where we're going through all of our new functionality and backstage, how you can use it in your day-to-day, -day, collecting feedback as well um, on anything else that um, that engineering team might be interested in using. Um, but outside of these training sessions, two other things that we found really useful is for any of our backstage related projects where you try and find a partner team, some other some team who has this pain point and really wants some tooling to solve for it um, so that we can work with them in tandem um, throughout the project to make sure that we're solving the problem for them, actually as well as getting early adopters who can help us evangelize backstage and this, this new functionality over time. Um, and we've been doing customer research, um, not as often as we would like, but we try to do it, I think every other quarter or every six months, we've been holding customer research sessions um, 
internally with different engineers across the org, both engineers who are highly active users in Backstage, as well as engineers who haven't really adopted it yet to try and find out what their current pain points are, how they're currently solving for them, um, getting feedback on any ideas for projects that we have or any um, functionality that we've recently implemented. Um, I, I would say one hard part about this is that our team is um, solely based it of full of engineers. We don't have a product designer or a um, PM. So a lot of this customer research, evangelization, education kind of falls on our engineering org, which has um, been a, a learning experience, I think, for a lot of us trying to become salespeople or designers or um, PMs when it comes to doing a lot of this. But it, it has been very helpful. And I don't think we would be able to get the adoption that we have uh, without doing um, any of the, the steps on this slide. Cool. So now that we've kind of gone through our adoption path and how we got to where we are, talk about some of our learnings um, over the past year. So the first one was that the, the scaffolder was a, a massive improvement to the previous process. Um, it was a common pain point that our templates would be out of date. So you template out a, a new service and um, get a bunch of comments around not doing best practices and having to fix them manually. But with our, our new approach using the backstage scaffolder, templates are always up to date. We have teams maintaining them and making sure that any new changes are implemented in the template um, quickly. Um, and I, one thing, though, that came out of this was that um, it wasn't necessarily a weekly or daily usage thing. So it didn't drive adoption very um, quickly into backstage because Scaffolding, although it's becoming more and more commonplace as we grow and we, we scaffold new services, it's still something some engineer may do once um, a quarter um, or so when they are starting a new project, but it's not something they're coming in weekly to um, scaffold out a new service. Um, the next thing was that we, we kind of wanted to think about Backstage as a, a two-sided marketplace where we're trying to cater to both users as well as platform developers. And you have to think about them as two separate personas. So one, you want to come into backstage on like a weekly or even a daily um, cadence and be using the tool, but the other you want to actively have thinking about developing their tooling within backstage. Um, I would say this is still something we're, we're trying to work on and getting other teams to actively um, think about developing in Backstage and thinking about the user experience first, as opposed to a, a secondary thing. Um, but we, we've we been working pretty closely with a lot of our um, teams in our org to try and get their functionality into Backstage. We don't see this scaling necessarily, um, as our team has had to do a lot of heavy lifting to get other teams functionality into Backstage. We'd like it to be a little bit more organic and have them actively lead development. But um, we think that it, it really is how, how you frame your, your projects around user experience first and um, the implementation second. Um, next thing is that metrics are important. Something that we've had since the beginning are metrics on our customer usage in Backstage. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this, I think, on the next slide, just because this is a, a topic I think we also want to discuss um, later in this session as well that was brought up. But it's something that without metrics, we wouldn't be able to gauge usage or adoption of Backstage. So it's a very important thing in order to actually track um, how that is going in the org over time. Um, something that we've noticed is that our, our usage is largely driven by users wanting to take actions more than information, at least for now. Um, originally, we thought the service catalog and its plethora of information would be really useful to engineers, but we've noticed that for the most part, engineers seem to have a good understanding of their own software, um, at least ones who have been here um, for a little while. New hires might use this to get a better sense of the information their team owns, but the main reason a lot of engineers come to Backstage is to do a specific action or take an action um, through the UI. Um, another learning uh, was at the beginning of this year, monorepo support wasn't um, necessarily thought of. I know Backstage uses um, a multi-repo approach internally, um, but it has really improved over the past year. So we have a monorepo at Brex and we had to do a lot of 
um, customizations to make things work. But um, as Backstage has adopted a more generic approach to a lot of things, um, we've been able to move closer to upstream or be on upstream essentially and um, use what the rest of the community uses um, for their mono repos as well. Um, kind of related to that is at the beginning of this year, we forked Backstage um, internally originally because we wanted to customize a lot of things and work very quickly. However, um, we quickly realized it set us back in that we couldn't update Backstage or keep it up to date very easily. Um, so over the last quarter, um, we worked to move off of a forked approach to Backstage and using the NPM packages that are open source. Um, it was a large undertaking, but we've seen um, our development um, improve greatly because of this. Now that we're upstream or up to date, um, for the most part, we try and stay up to date by updating weekly um, whenever the releases come out. And it's, yeah, it's really improved the developer um, productivity as well as given our um, users a, a better experience because they get the latest and greatest backstage functionality um, right at the gate. And then, yeah, the last learning is that obviously there is a very strong and great community um, within Backstage. We've been able to contribute upstream and get our changes in fairly quickly. These sessions have um, given us a lot of information around Backstage and how we can solve some problems internally, as well as the Discord um, has been really, really useful for getting feedback and asking questions from both the core maintainers as well as other adopters of Backstage. Um, and then, yeah, so metrics that we are currently tracking um, for context, we use segment internally or at least on our client facing um, applications. So we use that as well on Backstage. If you're not familiar, it is essentially a way to um, track different um, client side metrics and then send it to a host of different um, destinations. So we send it to our, our data lake or um and from there are able to visualize it in our data visualization tools some metrics that we have been tracking are weekly active users and weekly active sessions seeing um, how those are um, fluctuating over time or increasing over time um, we're tracking most active users and teams so we can see who our kind of power users are and go to them and see what they like about backstage um, or what are some other features that they uh, would like to see the most active users and teams and also the least active users and teams allow us to um, pinpoint those for those types of customers for our user research, which has been very helpful. Uh, we measure plugin usage. So what users are use, using what plugins, how often they're using them. Um, we generally try and set this up for new plugin launches as well. So as we're working on new projects, we make sure that we have the necessary dashboards set up so that we can track usage um, at launch time as well as over time for a, a new plugin that we've developed. And then lastly, something that we've been tracking is scaffolder metrics. So seeing what templates are being scaffolded out, um, how many per week, which users are scaffolding the most, things like that. And then lastly, uh, the conclusion. So some things we just wanted to make sure we touched on here that may we may not have touched on already is that uh, we'd like to echo the maintainers in that solve for a specific problem. We noticed at the very beginning when we were just trying to get a bunch of stuff into the catalog that it wasn't going to drive adoption because we weren't solving a specific problem. We were just trying to get some core primitives into Backstage. But over time, our projects have tried to focus on solving for specific problems and working closely with engineers. And we've seen those projects have um, gone a lot smoother and gotten early adoption um, right off the bat. Um, evangelization and education needs to be a priority. So um, Backstage and Spotify released a bunch of um, stuff today, um, which is great and would be very helpful internally. And I think that's something that um, all adopters need to make sure they're thinking about is uh, make sure you're educating engineering or your users or even your internal developer teams who will be developing for Backstage on Backstage, how they can use it, how easy it is to use. Um, upstream contributions are important. We, we've been contributing to the Kubernetes plugin recently and the Scaffolder um, plugin a little bit. And we, we think that seeing other teams and how much the uh, outside community has been helping there 
has really helped our own development. Um, specifically around the mono repo, um, there was a lot of things that came from external contributions around making mono repos um, kind of a, a first class um, priority in Backstage, and that was super helpful to our org. Um, there is you do need to try and balance platform work and feature development. So similar to the um, solve for a specific problem, um, sometimes you do need to do platform work in order to um, be able to implement a given project, but it is a healthy balance of making sure that you're not investing too much in platform functionality that um, isn't necessary for your, your current users or developers and making sure that you're developing new features. Um, and then lastly, just some areas of focus for us next year is that we want to make Backstage kind of our source of truth for team information. Right now, um, with this kind of rapid growth, teams change pretty often at Brex. They split, um, they change names um, with reorgs, things like that. And this kind of gets all out of sync across multiple tools and resources. We'd like to make sure Backstage is always um, up to date and can be used by other tools um, to create and um, create dependencies around different teams when, when necessary. Um, next, software quality and reporting. We've been working um, with an uh, external SaaS provider for scorecard and reporting functionality, um, which we find pretty important. We know there is work on a Tech Insights plugin um, in Backstage right now, um, but it's still fairly early, and um, we, we'd like to see where that goes as well, but it's something that we're going to be focusing on over the next year is trying to track quality of software and report it to the, the given teams or orgs um, over time to let them know how, how they're doing in comparison to others. Um, improving incident response is an ongoing thing that we're, we're working on. It's something we've been focusing on for the last couple of quarters as well, but something we will continue to focus on is quicker remediation, quicker detection, um, and just better tooling around our incident response. Um, and then last thing here is um, adding knowledge bases and documentation into Backstage. Um, right now, we haven't been using tech docs really at all. Um, we use Confluence internally, but we'd like to unify everything kind of in Backstage, maybe start looking into tech docs a bit more or other knowledge base um, solutions that we could bring into the uh, search functionality in, in Backstage as well. Um, but yeah, that's kind of everything. I'll try and take a look at the questions in the chat. Yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, the first question, um, which uh, I spotted in the chat, was about the workflow engine. What workflow engine do you integrate with? Yeah, so um, we integrate with a workflow engine called Temporal. Um, I believe the one that Bach brought up last time was Prefect, um, which was another one we also looked into, but um, the team that owns our workflow engine ended up going with Temporal, I think for authentication, RBAC related, they wanted our different workflows um, to be able to have different roles and things like that was, I think, the main driver for that decision. Um, we don't really own it, but we do integrate with it, so I can't speak too much to the internals of like that decision, but um, that's kind of the, the basic information. Cool. Um, another question is um, about keeping up to date uh, with the new releases updates. Um, can you give a little more detail on how you approach this? Yeah. Um, so as I stated, we originally had a fork. We actually used a, a Git subtree of the Backstage repo um, in our mono repo and would have to use Git functionality to merge in changes. Um, that became increasingly harder because of our internal build processes where we use a, a system that doesn't allow certain um, circular dependencies in your, your applications and JavaScript doesn't have the, or I guess Webpack doesn't have the same concerns as um, our build system did. But basically now we just use the NPM packages and the backstage CLI to keep things up to date. So every week on Friday normally, because the releases are on Thursday, um, someone will just run yarn backstage dash CLI versions bump or um, whatever that command is. And that's pretty much how we keep things up to date. Um, it lets you know what it's updating, if there's any change sets that you need to be aware of, and you can click on those and see exactly the, the updates. 
Um, getting to that was difficult, but now that we're there and we try to do it weekly, it's a fairly smooth process every week. There's minimal breaking changes, um, although they do happen from time to time. Um, but because of the chain sets, it's fairly easy to see what changed and how you can kind of fix it. Great. I I noticed a lot of enthusiasm uh, enthusiasm around um, how you approach the adoption uh, with the metrics and the, you know um, there was some excitement around that. Is there any chance maybe you might open source something around the metrics? Um, so one thought we've had is open sourcing kind of how we use segment. Um, right now you. It has Google Analytics kind of built into Backstage, but there's not segment first class support. Um, we've thought about um, putting that upstream. The actual, like the rest of it is a little bit harder to open source because it's more of just configuration um, in segment, but we um, definitely could upstream the segment approach. Right now we've kind of hacked it and replaced the Google tag script in the index.html with segment. Um, but yeah, we could, we could, upstream that if that's something people would be interested in uh, let's uh, let's uh, see if the chat uh, gets uh, gets enthusiastic i'm pretty sure there's a, there's a lot of folks who are interested in uh, in working on that uh, there, i noticed that it come it's coming up uh, a few times in uh, in discussions um the yeah another question from tim about the adoption and curious about what you see in the metrics and how you will, how it, it helps you guide the, the work you do on the platform. Um, yeah, so I guess something that we, the main thing that we like to track is like new releases and seeing how adoption of a project that we were just working on is going. We, we've we had projects that we thought were going to have pretty good adoption, but didn't um, at first, at least. Something was the API docs plugin. Um, we we thought it was going to be like a, a game changer for documentation because it has a better UI than just looking at protobuf files um, since they are um, markdown files created from the protobuf they have the comments in in them in a better format as well but um, originally that wasn't very adopted at all because we have a mono repo with all of our protobufs in it so it's fairly easy for engineers to kind of find the protobuf definitions and view the um, the files in line in their editors and stuff like that. Um, but over time, weirdly enough, it started to get adoption in the past quarter. Um, new engineers have really taken to it, um, as well as less uh, tenured engineers at Brex. Um, and we've seen it kind of skyrocket in adoption over the past few months, which is um, interesting to track over time. It took a very long time to get there, but um, partly because of our evangelization and education sessions with new hires. Um, we think that's kind of what driven that, that increase. Um, and then we've had other ones where um, engineers have kind of, we've been able to see engineers organically take to it. Um, something um, that we recently kind of have been trialing is the scorecards, as I said, and without any education sessions around that, we've seen engineers quickly drive to scorecards and wanting to get make sure their services are set up correctly, making sure their services are reliable, following best practices kind of all on their own. Um, so that was really a problem that engineers had and we were able to see um, it organically grow. Um, but yeah, I think that the most, how it has kind of led us is that we are able to quickly see um, our, our projects be either successful or less successful than we thought they were. And then either double down in that area or move on to something else. Um, or try and figure out what an additional project on top of that one would be that um, would increase usage. Does that answer the question? Or is there anything else there? I'll let uh, Tim decide if that answers the question. I think it did. Um, so the um, another thing that, um, well, at least I got really excited about it was the release uh, deploy management. Uh, um, also, a question from uh, Jill is, um, is that a custom tool you're using for release deploy management? Yeah, so sadly, it's very custom. Um, we do, as I said, we moved to like a GitOps flow for deployment, but um, our actual flow is managed by an internal service that we um, use. So it's not very open sourceable at this moment in time, um, but maybe at some point in the future, if we move to um, a 
a more canonical way of GitOps deployments or um, something, we, we can make it an open source bull plugin. But yeah, right now it's pretty um, specific to how we do deployments and it wouldn't be super useful to too many people outside, but thought it would be useful to think about as a uh, internal plugin that other developers use. Awesome. Yeah, so thank you so much for this presentation. It is It was really good. Uh, and thank you for sharing all those uh, learnings. I see a lot of thank yous, thank yous, and uh, enthusiastic uh, reactions. So that is uh, that is really good. Um, yeah, folks will well pretty much know where to find you if they have more questions. Let's keep the discussion going uh, in Discord. Um, and yeah, once again, thank you for uh, for joining us uh, today to share uh, to share more uh, about that. Um, for the folks who are interested, um, we will go over uh, one of the questions uh, we uh, have on the issue, um, which we like always do. We check the issues, just ask something. There will be some discussion and we will uh, pick it up in a community session. So never hesitate to, uh, to ask your question. Um, um, but first, uh, because I know we are running a little bit, uh, bit over time, um, this uh, next year, uh, on May 17th to May the 20th, uh, there is KubeCon Europe uh, and Cloud Native Con Europe. Um, and if you want to talk there, give a session together with us, um, please uh, feel invited to, uh, uh, to do so. Also, if you just want to submit your session, please do so as well. Uh, you mentioned you will share the uh, CFP link uh, in the chat which uh, will uh, close uh, this Friday, actually. So if you want to collaborate on something, uh, please let us know. Uh, and of course, never hesitate to uh, use the steel disk deck uh, to build your own amazing talk about all your uh, experiences. So with, uh, with backstage, either by contributing or how it changed uh, uh, anything for you, or maybe some plugin you created. So um, um, the link is in the chat. Uh, and if you want to join us uh, uh, together, uh, let us know. Uh, we're excited to um, to present together there. Um, yeah, next up, uh, well, Jen is already there. Hi, Jen. Hi again, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to quickly cover um, a topic that seems to get have a lot of enthusiasm in the issue and kind of took over the issue which is branding your backstage instance. And I think that as a whole, we haven't provided a lot of our own thoughts on this, as you can see with um, the evolution of uh, System Z to backstage and within the whole of our UI and experience, the, the branding of backstage internally is something, and, and in general branding at Spotify is, is very important. So we um, wanted to talk about it in the context of um, a deployment strategy and talk a little bit about what others have done and what we're seeing as a whole. So um, definitely willing to open this up to debate. It's not that there's one right way to go, but wanted to share the directions we see. So we typically see adopters go in three directions, which is executing on a full branding experience and custom name and UI for, and design for their um, backstage instance. We see folks keeping the backstage name, which selfishly gets me very excited because we, we believe part of it is a reflection of enthusiasm for backstage at the sort of um, individual developer level, though we rarely see that with um, with utilization of our color scheme and, and UI. That's typically the org theme, colors, um, um, and with, with some with, with some potential other cosmetic changes. Um, and then we see folks going descriptive um, and that will look often like a company name, dev portal, although obviously with material UI and colors, colors and theming um, and within their within their own instance as well. Um, so a couple of examples of this, uh, Splunk uh, has sh shared in a previous community session about Pink Phonebook. They made some serious UI changes to the software catalog um, and, uh, and obviously utilized their own color scheme, came up with a, um, a system for sharing kudos right inside backstage, something they called Bravo badges. We thought that was a great example. American Airlines also presented Runway. This has a much, um, uh, I, we, I think this is gorgeous and have like really, um, 
much slimmer um, uh, uh, utilization and of headers, et cetera, things that are a little bit, um, I would I would venture a little more elegant than what we offer out of the box. Um, and then we also saw um, a, that in our last session, uh, Box present um, Dev Portal, which is, as you can see, is also utilizing their colors and theming, um, but given sort of a more uh, standard and name. So a few more that we just wanted to share that we're seeing and we're figuring, you know, maybe we, if, if once we're able to and get permission from everybody, we can publish a list more broadly. These are folks who have put this in the wild or very gamely shared their, um, their naming within, uh, within the issue. Um, uh, some of my favorites are chauffeur with the Spanish spelling from Toyota as a nod to um, their uh, North American manufacturing hub in Mexico. Um, Netflix and Spotlight is obviously very clever. I'm very curious about Wharf if anybody from VOI is here. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we, so, and then we also see some folks going very straightforward or even utilizing um, um, backstage as we've seen, in, as we see in several um, cases with uh, Brex, Expedia, and PagerDuty. So our recommendation as a whole, branded is better. I mean, that's part of, you know, why Backstage was it was built on and sort of in the core philosophy and architecture it has in terms of being highly customizable and extensible. Things we're continuing to work on in terms of material UI and easy out of the box design elements um, and uh, co homepage composability. It should, the, the brand of your Backstage engine should best fit your org needs. And we believe branding is an adoption best practice. It builds in third, in internal enthusiasm and ownership within the community. Um, but oftentimes we understand that folks are a little bit limited by the fact that they may not have product design or front end resources. So if you have those, we do recommend fully branding your developer portal. And with that, I will stop sharing. And if anybody has vehement disagreement on that front, <laughs> please let us know. Thanks so much. It's it's always so good to see all the like um, creative things and like. Sometimes I see the name, I'm like, why, <laughs> why? But then there's a there's some logical explanation uh, to that. Um, so from from a marketing perspective, um, would like branding help also with with the adoption? Is that a question more broadly or a question for me? <laughs> yeah, that's a question for you. You're 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 here. You're you're. I mean, I think in, I think in general hero. what we. What we've published a lot around is kind of like metrics for six or, or what we've started to bring more conversation to from the Spotify perspective is metrics we measure, et cetera. I think, um, you know, Kat and others who work on our design team would definitely argue that like the, the UI and UX experience of the whole thing is part of what makes it sticky. I would agree that we and, and, in, and internally at at Spotify, we do a lot. We did a lot of work initially as we were really trying to encourage um, plug-in development um, and continual extensibility of the of the the platform itself. And then now a lot of that internal marketing revolves around um, updates and, and best practices on usage. Um, so there is significant internal marketing effort that happens for backstage here at Spotify. And we would, I would definitely say that as a whole, that it's a, it's, it is, it is, it should be considered kind of part of your broader kind of adoption deployment strategy and part of the part of, and looking at metrics that you can measure um, and whether or not marketing is moving the needle on some of those things. Yeah, I think that that will also help folks. Um, um, yeah, having some um, some more weight to like, you know, having that discussion around. Well, should we do a generic uh, branding, or do we need to change the name, and do we need to have somebody look at uh, at the UI? I see people sharing stuff as well in the chat. Uh, I'm not getting distracted by that. Trying. Um, so there's also a link in the chat on customizing the look and feel. Um, there's a document around that. Um, probably we will create maybe some, well, bigger uh, piece around that, maybe some blog post um, uh, in the near future um, to, to share just what, uh, what we learned. Um, and yeah, keep the chat going in, uh, in Discord after this uh, session and uh, share, show off your design and your names. And um, because this is a recurring topic and I noticed that like the last community session, we also had a little question, which also, was also a little 
aligned around 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 this topic. So um, yeah, let's uh, let's help each other out here and uh, maybe a humble brag a little bit about your uh, implementation of backstage. That is cool. Um, so there was uh, one other question, but um, yeah, we unfortunately are a little bit uh, going uh, over time already. Um, and that is the question from Jay Russo. And um, it is about the group management and reorgs. Um, we will, if you're all right with that, uh, take the question and uh, use that in the uh, next community session, which will be in January after we are all well rested uh, after our well-deserved, uh, uh, well, probably break for most of us. So um, thank you so much for joining us for this community session. Um, I promise to take this issue and put it uh, in uh, this, this comment and put it in the next issue. Um, and yeah, as soon as it's created, share, um, let's discuss and uh, let's not stop the discussion here, but uh, uh, continue in uh, in Discord. Um, tomorrow we have the contributors uh, session, uh, which will uh, will of course also be nice. We will be closing off there. Um, we have Vincenzo showing uh, something off as well, so that will be very good to join. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Um, please do not forget to download. Um, the holiday gift Jen just pasted in the chat. And that is a Zoom background where you can show off your enthusiasm and your love for, well, the thing that, that binds us all together uh, like glue, and that is backstage and our passion for having happy developers. So take the um, take it, uh, steal it, uh, like, uh, like Jen so nice put, put it in the blog post. Uh, also, um, the deck, just use it, uh, tune it to your to your own needs. Um, the video, well, I'd love to see it plastered around the socials. So don't hold back there. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, let's. Uh, I hope to see you next time.